All right, the second point I want to make uh, in terms of idealist uh, uh, practice, uh, uh, implications of idealist philosophy for education has to do with curricular issues, uh, deciding in a broad stroke what would be included on the curriculum and what would not be included on the curriculum. Uh, and uh, this is certainly one of the big rubber meets the road issues for the connection between uh, philosophical theory and educational practice. So what I want to do is uh, uh, just broadly uh, divide the curriculum into uh, uh, two categories here, things that we would include and things that we would not include and we'll consider some uh, standard curricular uh, elements and see how an idealist would think through whether to, uh, to include those things on the, on the curriculum or not. Now, there's some obvious candidates. If we are, uh, for example, religious idealists, then uh, as religious idealists, we uh, almost always have a, an approved scripture uh, that is part of our tradition. And so a major part of the curriculum is going to be uh, our scripture. If we are not religious idealists, if we're more uh, secular in our idealistic approach as say Plato was and perhaps uh, Kant was, uh, then we're not going to uh, teach uh, simply out of scripture. But what we are interested in is things that are not physical in their orientation, not bodily, not concrete. We are interested in things that are abstract, that are pure, that train the student's mind uh, in, in that direction. And so one very obvious candidate is mathematics. Uh, uh, and it's, I don't think, an accident that historically many of the great mathematicians have uh, found themselves attracted to idealist forms of philosophy. So we can do math, uh, uh, geometry, uh, algebra, and, uh, and so on up, up to uh, higher order mathematics, and that would certainly be a legitimate thing. We might say uh, psychology is a legitimate thing to include in the curriculum because of the nature of its subject matter. Uh, psychology studies the psyche, and of course, as idealists, we would be more likely to study the psyche uh, in dualistic terms. But if our subject matter is the mind, the spirit, the soul, the apparatus right, of, of consciousness, our consciousness, and so forth, coming to understand that certainly can be, from an idealist perspective, a, a worthy uh, uh, um, subject matter. Okay, how about uh, literature? Right? Would we include literature? in the tradition. Here I think as an idealist there are any number of answers that are that are possible. One thing we might say is well we already have scripture and uh, uh, we don't need to have any uh, literature beyond scripture in that scripture is, uh, is a self-contained uh, and universal source of truth here. And if we are very doctrinaire in our approach, we might want to say we don't want to have any uh, confusing uh, bodies of literature uh, presenting different accounts of the human condition because that would be confusing to the students. And so we might not allow any literature other than uh, studying the scripture, for example, as, as literature. If we're more liberal in our religion or if we're not uh, religious as idealists, uh, we would, I think, uh, include uh, literature as, uh, as an important uh, subject matter, but the literature included would have to uh, uh, meet certain standards. In many cases, the standards that are going to be met are, are moral standards. We want to uh, make moral education uh, a central part of what education is about. Literature certainly can be a very useful vehicle for exploring uh, issues of character, good versus evil, and, and dramatizing and concretizing things in a way that are, are, are accessible to students. And so if we're interested in training moral character, literature can be very useful that way. But we do, of course, want to make sure that the right moral lesson comes through in the literature that we choose. And so we would choose uh, uh, works of literature that involve moral themes of good, according to our conception, triumphing over evil uh, rather than you know, any sort of a, a dystopian novel or an anti-hero type of novel. Those, I think, would not make the cut if we are idealists um, in our approach. So we might have a moral criterion uh, in this particular case. Uh, here, uh, Harry Potter, uh, the phenomenon of the, the wild success of the Harry Potter novels and their enormous popularity among students uh, who, are, who are learning to read and uh, advancing in leaps and bounds in their reading ability. If we think of the controversy over uh, the, the Harry Potter novels, uh, many students, are, or many teachers rather, are, are very happy to include the Harry Potter novels in the curriculum, 
uh, just uh, for the fact that the students are reading something and they're reading it voraciously uh, and there are lots of things that, that can be talked about there and there are moral issues in there as well. But if we think about the opposition to the inclusion of the Harry Potter novels, those almost always come from an idealist perspective, particularly a competitor uh, idealist perspective. The idea being then the Harry Potter novels that you do have lots of uh, beings that come out of the idealist tradition. You do have spirits and, and demons, right, and ghosts and magical powers and so forth, and a fairly full apparatus of, of supernaturalism, uh, an alternate world, a higher world that is better than the, the grubby world of, of the Muggles, right, so to speak. But from many idealists or many religious idealist perspective, it's, it's the wrong account of the supernatural phenomenon that is being taught there instead of the right account of supernatural phenomenon that is being taught. And so, in effect, on metaphysical grounds, they will dismiss the Harry Potter novels as well. Some realist, uh, uh, sorry, religious idealists though, also will object to the Harry Potter novels uh, on moral grounds because they will make the argument that Harry Potter, for example, uh, uh, if you see all of the things that he does, he's almost always breaking the rules, right? There are rules that are put in place for the good of the children, and not a chapter goes by that he doesn't break one or several of the rules, and he's uh, luring his friends into breaking the rules as well. He thinks of himself as above the rules. He thinks he's special. He's disrespectful to various teachers and so forth. And so in many cases, the moral character traits, or the character traits rather that Harry Potter uh, represents, while admirable and attractive to some moral traditions, are anathema to many religious idealist traditions, and so uh, they will object to the inclusion of Harry Potter uh, in the curriculum on that grounds. So, first point being the literature would have to uh, 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 satisfy moral criteria if we're going to include it for, for that purpose uh, as a vehicle for teaching character.